Hi, thank you so much for joining us. This is Eric L. Donovan, the Mindset Disruption Strategist. And we are here today on Redefining Success, the Kingdom Builder Spotlight with one of my favorite people, uh, Robin John, who is the founder and CEO of Eventide Asset Management out of Boston. But I'm going to just tell you this story and this interview, you've got to stick around for, and you need to stay for the whole thing because just hearing the story of what Robin and his team are about. Um, Eventide is a mutual fund asset management company that focuses on the on human flourishing in the way that they look at investing. And it is so beautiful. And it has, Robin and his team have had an influence on me and my life. Their way of thinking has sharpened me, has shaped me. And I think it's going to do the same thing for you. And so I just am excited for Robin to tell his story, to tell the story of some things that have gone on at Eventide. It's been an incredible journey. Much like me, they had this great idea that launching in 2008 was a great idea, um, but that's a God thing. And God redeems times that don't make sense to everyone else. And I think that's a big part of what Robin will be talking about with us today. So Robin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Eric. Happy to be here. Um, Robin, I, I think the best place to start, because I know you, but most of the people listening probably do not. So give us a 30,000 foot view of you, of your life, and kind of, kind of where um, you think your journey begins, or the most important things about your journey that we should know as we kind of start here. Yeah, I was born in India moved to the U.S., to Boston, um, on my eighth birthday, ah. and uh, went to a school here in Boston called Tufts University, and did a degree, degree in economics, and I'm married, have three children, two girls and a boy, yeah. and my wife and children and I, we all live here in Boston, and in 2008, I had the opportunity to co-found Eventide with Finney and a few other founding members. And um, we do, as Eric said, what we call uh, investing that makes the world rejoice. Mm. We seek to invest in ways that honor God and uh, love others, to love our neighbor. Mm. Robin, what was it? So you're, you came, you're eight years old. Um, you're now you're in college studying economics. What what is the journey from that to you and Finney getting connected with this idea, with this thought of what it could be? Because I mean, again, we go back to 2008, and if most people remember 2007, 2008, I mean, this is one of the ugliest. It is the ugliest recession I think any of us have lived through. Um, but at the same time, you're feeling a call or a tug on your heart to do something no one else is doing. So tell us a little bit about that journey and that story. Yeah, you know, for me, it really probably started in 2006, maybe 2005. And I tell the story sometimes, you know, I was uh, working at a large custody bank and, um, you know, they had asked me if I wanted to be in India Mm. Uh, and, you know, they were outsourcing, uh, you know, back office functions to India, things like income collections and tax reclaim, overnight pricing, corporate actions. So I am learning these functions, taking it to India, and, uh, and I was living in a guest house in India, mm. and um, the guest house was beautiful. Uh, I had a cook and a housekeeper that took care of me, and, uh, and... Uh, and uh, I, you know, personally, I like to sleep in a very cold room. So I had an air conditioner. Every single room had its own air conditioner. And uh, one day I am uh, in the kitchen just talking to the cook and the housekeeper. Their names rhymed. It was Amal and Kamal. Mm. And, uh, and so, so anyway, I looked over and I saw in the pantry area, uh, just a prayer mat and I just said hey guys uh, are you sleeping here and they said yes they called me sir yes sir I, we sleep here there's a little closet 
kind of a stone floor, no blanket, no pillow. And so I remember that night, uh, I, uh, you know, I'm lying in my bed, beautiful, comfortable bed. And I'm thinking about these two guys, you know, sleeping mm. in the, in the pantry and, and I couldn't fall asleep. And I remember sending emails to management in the U S and the management said, well, you know, we're outsourcing that to an Indian vendor, uh, you know, supplier. We're not responsible for how they, what they do there. Mm. And I remember thinking this huge American company has, has a lot of power in the situation. Uh, they could easily make some demands and make changes to how people are being treated over there. Mm. And, uh, and so anyway, so that really had an impact on me and just seeing the power that business has to either serve people and to love people, to treat people with dignity yep. or to treat them um, with disrespect and to treat them like they're almost less than human beings. Uh, so that kind of started my, I think the process of thinking about my purpose and um, initially, you know, I, I no longer wanted to be in business and, in, in, you know, in, 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 in the professional world. I was, you know, I started praying for a calling into ministry, into church ministry. Mm. And, and ultimately God used all of these experiences and the prayer to help us have to get the vision for getting even time started. So you're, this is, that was 2006, you said? Yeah. Okay. So at which point, did you already know Finney at this point? Yes, I've known Finney like through church. The two of us, like in around 2001, started a house church together. Okay. And my brother as well, there were three of us. So I was already very close with Finney. And uh, just to expand on the previous story that I said, um, in 2007, I took a job at a university, internal audit, and I lasted for about a month and then I got fired. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, and meanwhile, I was al already praying that God would be calling me into kind of the church ministry. Mm. And that firing was probably the best thing that happened to me. So that led me to asking Finney and my brother and Jason, who used to be a part of the house church, uh, to, but Jason had moved to Louisville, but he would call in and we would pray together. Uh. And late night, I would, you know, pray in the basement of my parents' house uh, by the washing machine and dryer and just sit there kneeling and just praying for purpose. And then I asked Finney and, and, and these other guys to pray with me. And we would fast one day a week together and we would pray and we would do this for many many months and it, you know and then initially the prayer was you know what should robin do with his life uh and then eventually it became what can we all do together to honor god um and some of the ideas were nonprofit ideas but ultimately the idea of investing um in a way that is honoring god became something that we all became passionate about so how does this go from, I mean, because they're not at this point, unless I'm wrong, there are not a lot of people who are even focused on this or thinking about this. Am I wrong? Or were there people who had laid down at least a bit of a path or did you kind of have to create the path? No, there were, you know, um, you know, people like Art Alley at Timothy Plan, okay. Rusty Leonard, Stewardship Partners. Yep. And, th and there were other financial advisors too. Uh, there was a group called the NACFC. National okay. Association of Christian Financial Consultants. Yeah. So there were others who had kind of laid the, the foundation. And I don't think that without that foundation, you know, when even Eventide started, it was very difficult. In the first year, we couldn't even get a million under management. Mm. But mm. it was it was because Rusty and, and Art Alley and others had laid a foundation, there, there were a group of investors that were wanting to partner with us mm. and wanting to partner with this purpose. Uh, you know, um, you know, without that, I think, you know, you know, we would have had to wait for like a five-year track record right. to really prove out our process 
for the broader market to uh, to adopt and to embrace what we were doing, and that would have been very difficult for us. Sure. But but there was I would say a base, you know, audience, a foundation that was already laid and built. So I do really owe owe a lot to uh, to the Rusty Leonards and the Art Alleys of the world. Yeah, yeah. What was so? Did every in this first year that you're trying to launch and do everything? Did everyone? leave previous jobs and you guys are all in on eventide or what what did the world look like when y'all said okay we've got an idea take us through kind of we have an idea we have a god-sized vision for something and i think this is something especially for listeners who are like god has given me a vision but i can't figure out how to get there i think what would be helpful robin is to understand what is the process of receiving a god-sized vision you're praying and you're fasting and then starting to bring it through to fruition and the, but also I'm going to imagine, and you can tell me no, but if you're having trouble getting a million under management in the first year, there have to be some naysayers. You're like, Hey, you know what? You may think you're hearing from God, but you may need to go do something else instead of staying focused on this. So tell us a little bit about that part of the journey. I could probably, probably talk for an hour. Well, then come on. <laughs> that part of the journey. Um, so Yes, we were praying, but honestly, we had a, we created a business plan, and if we look back at that business business plan today, um, if, you know, if, if I need a good laugh, I I I, I, I look back at that business plan. It was, yeah. you know, we um, we didn't have any, uh, have really anything figured out, mm. and um, we didn't have a good strategy. We didn't we didn't have a good business plan. But what, what we did have is strong conviction and a strong purpose. And uh, so, uh, and we prayed. And I, and I really believe that God opened doors for us. So I want to I give you a couple of examples and stories of this. Please. So, um, you know, initially when I was talking to Finney, I remember saying to Finney, hey, Finney, I know you don't invest in things like pornography and abortion. I never invested. I, I didn't have any money in the stock market. No 401k plan, nothing at the time. I was uh, 26 years old when we started this conversation, and I was 27 when we started Eventide. And so, um, and so I really um, like was thinking about, you know, Finney's investment philosophy, mm. which was avoiding ill-gotten gain. Yeah. And I said to Finney, hey, Finney, do you think other Christians would be interested in this? If we started something, we could call others into partnering with us. Yeah. And, um, you know, we went through scripture passages like Proverbs 1, which talks about avoiding ill-gotten gain, mm -hmm. not sharing a purse with people that are plundering. A mutual fund is a purse. Many people are sharing that, in that purse together. Mm -hmm. And basically the, the verse says, my son, if sinful men entice you, if they say let's plunder, do not go, go along with them. Do not share a purse with them. Do not share in their ill-gotten gain. Uh, Isaiah 3 talks about, God says here, there's plunder, there's unjust gains in, in your house. I remember as I was reading uh, Proverbs 1, kind of reading from the lens of an investor, mm. right? My son, if sinful men entice you, my son, if when you invest, if sinful men entice you, um, he basically says, um, like, cast lot with us, invest with us. Mm. We will share a purse. Uh, the mutual fund is a purse. Yeah. We will fill our houses with plunder. We will fill our uh, 401k plans, our IRAs with plunder. I remember reading it within the lens of an investor mm. and really feeling convicted that the church and the, and the, the Christian world needs to be investing in this way. Yeah. And uh, But then what really happened is, you know, we were praying and we were set to launch the, the, uh, our first product, our first mutual fund mm -hmm. on July 1, 2008. Okay. On June 13, 2008, I know this is the date because I have an email uh, with the date on it. A man named Tim Weinhold reaches out to me. And Tim doesn't know that we're starting Eventide or an investment firm. Tim 
just basically finds out that there's a house church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Oh. That, that Penny and I have started many years ago. And Tim had never been to a house church in his life. He Googles house churches in Cambridge, Massachusetts, shows up at our house church. And again, like uh, I was speaking at a conference recently telling the story and I was telling people, hey, you know, this may not seem like a big deal to many people. If you go to a mega church, you get random people showing up all the, all the time. Right, right. Um, but in a small house church where, where it's mostly students, a man like Tim Weinhold just doesn't show up. Yeah. And guess what? Tim was a deep thinker when it comes to Bible and business, mm. faith and business. Tim is on the board of Seattle Pacific University, uh, the, the, the board for um, Jeff Van Duser, the dean of the Seattle Pacific University. Jeff Van Duser wrote the book, Why Business Matters to God. Oh. So Tim Weinhold shows up at our house church. He overhears that we're starting this Christian mutual fund. Uh -huh. He says, hey, I know what it means to be Christian. I know what a mutual fund is. Put that together for me. And we said, well, we're going to avoid all gone gain. And he said, you know, that's really good. That's great that you're doing that. But if you're investing in business and if you're partnering with businesses, uh, what types of businesses should we be partnering with? Mm. Um, and so that really changed our, the conversations happening at Eventide. And I would even argue that changed the conversations that were, were happening within the Christian advisor network. Yeah. Because I think up to this point, it was much more about avoiding ill gotten gain and avoiding, um, you know, like, like um, um, immoral or mm -hmm. sin stocks. Mm -hmm. That was more of that conversation. Yeah. And I think God really used Eventide to kind of expand that, that conversation. And I, I don't want to downplay that. I think that's extremely needed. Uh, you know, Romans chapter 12 says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't want to in any way say that's not needed. In fact, at Eventide, from the Russell 1000, 700 companies get screened out from our, um, from our exclusionary screens. Mm. Um, but, but I do think that's one part of the conversation. Yeah. Um, avoiding your gun game, but really, what do we want to partner with? What are the mm. types of companies we should be embracing? So at Eventide, we built with Tim's help and later with Jason's help, uh, this philosophy, this framework yeah. that we call Business 360. Mm. It really starts with the love your neighbor commandment in the Bible. I love that. I love that. One of the things that's interesting, Robin, and we may come back to this because I really, there's so much more to the story. I know there is. Um, but one of the things I've seen a lot lately, especially we talk about this kind of redefining success is that I think a lot of the world and a lot of people are sensing like something doesn't feel quite right. And it's the, I've talked to my older son about this a little bit, just this idea of, you know, there is this frustration of, you know, some of the bigger companies that like, man, you're making all this profit, but are you flourishing the people that work for you? You know, are you in a position where, you know, the, that, you may be flourishing as a business owner, but are we seeing the flourishing of your people? Are we seeing the flourishing of your business and its impact? And I think there's, you know, without real, I mean, as believers, we'd say this, but even the non-believers are experiencing like a righteous anger over a lot of businesses that out there that are like profit at all cost. As one of the ways that I've kind of worded is profit versus people versus profit and people. And that's really what your business 360 is. What are you seeing at least right now from the same passion, even among believers and non-believers, because what I think that is so revolutionary that you just unpacked about what Eventide did is this idea of it's not just about what we're avoiding, but it's about what we're intentionally focusing on. Yes. Yeah. Um, so first of all, you know, we want to invest in companies that are loving their serving well, their customers, yeah. employees, supply chain, host communities, environment, society. It's a holistic view by which we look at business. Um, but to your, to your question, to your point, we also want to be that company, right? So we want to be a company that we would be proud to invest in as investors. Right. And so we do take that very seriously. So some of the things that we've done is we've tr tried to operationalize our mission into the company. Mm. And 
from the hiring process to our sales process to our investment process, we have, uh, I think, done a pretty good job of operationalizing our mission into the company. Um, if you talk to our employees, um, you will hear, for the most part, that I think that we have a great culture at Eventide. Yeah. Uh, you know, we last year got two different Best Places to Work awards. Uh, one was um, a large investment um, in a publication, and another was a local, like Boston Business Journal. Yeah. And uh, and every year, what I do is I do two broad surveys with our employees. One is an internal uh, culture survey, a net promoter score survey for our employees. Mm. And that survey has like 60 questions on it. Yeah. I do another CEO survey where I want to know how I'm personally doing, uh, you know, as, a, as the CEO, as a leader at Eventide. And it's anonymous. I want people to speak freely and I want to know what people are saying. And uh, we also do net promoter score surveys every year with uh, our financial advisor base as well to really hear from our advisors where we could be better and where we could be serving our client um, better. Um, we also, um, you know, really take seriously just, you know, uh, things like compensation, mm. work-life balance, benefits. In fact, this morning I got an email from one of our employees thanking us for our generous benefit package. Mm. Um, this, this one employee deals with a lot of just you know, headaches and, you know, issues, migraines, and just was thankful for just the health benefits that we offer. Yeah. Uh, another employee recently reached out and emailed Finney, Jason, and myself and said that this person's wife works in the benefits area uh, of another company and just said even types benefits is by far the best she's seen. And so, uh, we, you know, we want to love and serve our people yeah. and, uh, and um, even something like, uh, like um, having forced time off. We have unlimited vacation, but I know that our people are overachievers. <laughs> and I know that many of them don't take the time that they should take off. Yeah. So one of the things that we've done is we have a company-wide week off hmm. in um, the summer, another company-wide week off during the Christmas week. Wow. So, so this week, it's the last week of June and the July 4th weekend. And then again, uh, the weekend, the week of Christmas, New Year's. And we do that because it's, it forces us to take time off together. And I think that's healthy. Yeah. Otherwise, if I try to take a week off and I know everyone else is working, my mind is still with everyone else, right? Yep. And, and I know the emails are coming and I'm going to come back to all this work. But by forcing everybody to take time off together, it actually, there's actually real downtime for everyone. Yeah. So we try to be very intentional in how we serve, serve our people at Eventide. Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, tell us about some, so we, we kind of went from, you know, idea and it was hard to get off the ground to we talk a little bit about kind of the success and where you are today. What would you say, what has been maybe one or two of the hardest points from 07 to today and how you guys got through that as a team or as, you know, what, what would you say were kind of some of the turning points or even God moments of the last, you know, 14, 15 years? Yes. You know, th there were so many challenges along the way. Uh, I mentioned the firing situation. Yeah. Um, but uh, even after we started Eventide, first year we had a million under management, second year we got just three million, six million. When you're running a mutual fund, until you get to about 25, 30 million, you're not even break even yet. Right. Like in terms of the fund expenses, we got to oh, pay back right. the fund. Um, but for us, like, you know, I'm taking a $10,000 salary. My wife is still in school. We're going into debt. You know, it, you know, it, it is challenging. Uh, but when you feel so committed and confident that you're doing what you're supposed to do, uh, I'll give you one example uh, that I shared just last week in a public setting was the story of, uh, you know, how, because we really had a very tight budget mm -hmm. at even time the first couple of years, 
uh, I would try to save every single dollar when possible. So I had this rule that if I traveled, you know, I stay in a motel for that cost no more than fifty dollars. And sometimes my wife would come with me, and it was pretty pretty bad. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she, she she still talks about it. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, just uh, like sometimes I would have to put my like t-shirts over the pillows <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but, it, but it was pretty challenging times right when you're you know doing everything you can to try to make your budget your, your money last longer yeah. until you're finally finally a break even and you know you know so the story I was sharing was one story where uh, I had to go from but you know, from at the time I was living in Dallas, to, from Dallas to Philadelphia, a, a financial advisor had asked me to share um, to a group of an audience, um, maybe, maybe maybe clients, maybe prospects, and the conversation I had with the advisor was one of values-based investing. So I thought that's what the advisor wanted me to share. So the flight from Dallas to Philadelphia was expensive. For some reason, the flight from Dallas to LaGuardia was cheap. And the rental car was cheap, so it was cheaper for me to fly there and drive. Really? To Philadelphia. And, and uh, um, I emailed this slide deck to the, to the financial advisor, and I'm now in New York. I'm driving to Philadelphia. On my way, I get a phone call saying, Robin, I don't want you to do this talk. I said, I thought this is what you wanted. And, he's, and he said, no. Um, I said, well, I could do something else. Uh, do you want, want me to talk about markets or something more general. He said, no, don't come. And I remember thinking, man, I just, you know, you know, just, you know, I came from Dallas. I'm almost in Philadelphia now. And I only had one other meeting on my calendar. And it was with, and, 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 I, and I believe that both of these people were okay with me sharing their names. Uh, in fact, I got their permission to share in other contexts. But a man named Ward Kiever. He's a financial advisor with LPL. Yep. We're not on the LPL platform. Ward was helping us get on there. And so I had a meeting with Ward yeah. and, um, and Ward noticed that I'm discouraged. And he said, Robin, are you okay? You seem a little discouraged. And I said, Ward, you know, I came for this other purpose and he got canceled. And Ward said, I'm gonna pray for you right now. But before you get back to New York, New York, you get another phone call and you get a meeting. Mm. And it sounds almost impossible, <laughs> um, but I'm driving from Philadelphia to New York City. I get a phone call from the office of a financial advisor named Jim Ryan. And Jim Ryan is, in terms of like assets under management, like the most successful financial advisor probably I know. Um, every year on the Barron's list, yeah. And I get a call from his office. I left a message, I think that office like three weeks prior. And I get a call saying, if you could be here in 30 minutes, Jim will meet with you. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim was with Merrill Lynch. We're not on the Merrill Lynch platform. Yeah. But I remember saying, hey, I'll be there. I'm like 20 minutes away from um, you know, the office. Uh, Jim's office is in Manhattan, Bank of America building. Yeah. And I remember meeting with him. He met with me for about 25 minutes. And then I come down, I sit by the New York Harbor. I remember just breaking down. And um, uh, you know, I was not expecting any investments. Now, I'm not on the LPL platform, the, you know, our products are not, or on the Merrill Lynch platform. But I just felt deeply in my heart that God was leading me. Mm. So even though it felt like a day of failure, yeah. from a human perspective, I felt that God's hand was upon me. And so I just remember sitting there and just, I cried and I thanked God for mm. just leading me. And so, so these are the types of examples that I think like, like, like God was just showing me even in my times of this being, feeling discouraged that he was still leading me. Mm. And, and so, yeah, so I was, so I, I so, so, so I've seen God's hand um upon our work and yeah. 
And I'm, you know, yeah, so I'm just so thankful. I, thank you for sharing that story. I was reading in Ezekiel 30 this morning and uh, no, not Isaiah 30 this morning. And it was specifically about how the hard times and the struggle are often the place that God is opening and teaching us the things he wants us to see. And so many times, if we're not careful, and this is, this is a different definition of success, right? Success sometimes from the world's perspective would be like struggle is a sign you should stop. Struggle is a sign that you need to quit going. And from God's perspective, perspective struggle is the teacher. Yeah. Struggle yeah. is, you know, it's where he wants us to lean more into him and trust him more, um, even when maybe even others around us don't see the same thing we see. Yeah. Agreed. No, that's... And, uh, and when you look at biblical examples, you know, that's what you see throughout the Bible, too. Um, you know, Joseph had to go through the struggles yeah. in, order, in, in order for God to be able to use him. Um, David had to go through struggles. Moses had to go through struggles. You see that throughout Scripture. And, and um, the struggles is, is needed. It's not just an accident. Yeah. So God needs us to go through those struggles, to humble us, to teach us. Um, me having gone through a firing situation yeah. makes me much more empathetic when I have to deal with a, a difficult employee situation yeah. uh, because I've gone through that situation, right? So, um, so yeah, so, so, so I think God takes us through these situations uh, to prepare us uh, to, to, to do what he needs us to do. Absolutely, absolutely. Robert, I don't know how much you could get into this because I don't want to, I know that you've got a compliance team that sits behind and says, you can't say this and you can do that. But I think one thing, when you have a business that is about promoting human flourishing and you have a business that says investing that makes the world rejoice, you know, and you've got this business 360 process. If I'm a person who doesn't know who Eventide is or don't know anything about the way that you do this, there are some, from some definitions of success, the only thing that matters is return on investment, right? Give me a good return, and that's all I care about. But one of the questions I think I would ask you, especially sitting here from your perspective, is, you know, what have you guys found to be true, you know, when you put the focus from a kingdom perspective on promoting human flourishing first, as opposed to the profitability side or what just is going to give you the most highest return or things like that? Have you seen that still be a blessing to the company or to the investors and to the people? Yes, uh, we actually think it's very much, um, we think the world has it backwards. Yeah. Uh, we think that those that are pursuing profit at any cost often do the wrong things to get there uh, mm -hmm. because they tend to be so short-term focused, so reactive, and they don't really invest in long-term healthy growth and healthy teams healthy culture. And so uh, uh, I think a biblical um, approach to business and investing is actually uh, a very healthy approach to business and investing um, because you're focused on loving people, taking care of people. Um, there are so many examples within Wall Street uh, that I could point to. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, one example I sometimes talk about is like Walmart versus Costco. Mm. You know, Walmart, Costco on average pays three times more per employee than Walmart does because Walmart keeps people on a part time basis, doesn't pay the health benefits. And Costco, therefore, on average, pays three times more per employee. Wow. But per store, Costco is more profitable than Walmart. It wow. doesn't make sense from a human right. perspective, but but uh, I think what Costco is doing is creating a virtuous cycle yeah. where employees are loyal, they're productive, they're not they're not spending all their resources on training new employees and uh, on, on the turn on turnover cost. Uh, the employees are growing and more, becoming more and more productive as they stay loyal and as they stay with the company. Mm. Um, whereas another company that might be so focused on trying to like squeeze that profit from that employee, those employees don't stay with the company. 
now you're paying more money to replace that employee, to train a new employee. So I do think there are companies that are really focused on doing the, doing the right thing, taking care of their people, taking care of their customers, are actually creating a virtuous cycle. Mm. I actually like the, a, a statement that the Southwest Airlines uh, CEO said, and you know we, we would not invest in Southwest for various reasons, but, but I like the statement that the, the CEO said. He said, uh, we take care of our employees so that our employees can take care of our customers mm. so that our customers can take care of our shareholders. Mm. Um, hmm. So hmm. Uh, companies, I think that kind of focus first on the employees and then the customer ultimately yeah. are doing well for their shareholders too. Yeah. Uh, but, but CEOs who are so focused on hey, the next quarterly earnings and they're, they, they become so, so short-term minded that, that, that ultimately they're not actually taking care of their shareholders. Yeah. Mm, that's so wise. That's so wise. Robin, I know we're going to run up against time here. One of the things that I'd love for you to share with the listeners, I know that the Bible plays a huge role and God's word plays a huge role in your life. Are there any, is there any other book or anything that you have that like has also just been a great influence or a great shape on kind of the way that you think and the way that you view the world that would be valuable for the audience? Yeah, so it all depends on like the arena you're operating in. Yep. So if you're a business person, I really would encourage you to read Why Business Matters to God mm. by Jeff Van Duser. If you are a leader you know, in any capacity, organizationally, um, Patrick Lencioni's, Lencioni's books are really good. Yeah. The, the ideal team player, five dysfunctions of a team, the advantage. Um, I like uh, a book called uh, Great People Decisions. Mm. It's a little bit of a heavy read. Okay. But, but if you want to build a healthy culture that really focuses on excellence and really understanding competency. And if you're wanting to hire the right people for the right role, yeah. Great People Decisions is a good book. Mm. But if you partner that with books like Patrick Lencioni's, which is much more focused on culture, uh, loving people, uh, creating a culture of um, uh, collaboration and loving others. Yeah. Um, I'd even tied our values are excellence, high integrity, and family spirit. When, um, when you bring all three of those together, um, uh, I think we create a wonderful culture at Eventide. Mm. Outside of work, outside of business, outside of um, kind of leadership books, uh, something I've been personally just en enjoying recently mm -hmm. is uh, books about and by a a an old Indian missionary named, um, his name is Sadhu Sundar. Singh. So Sadhu Sundar Singh is probably the most famous Christian in India. Exactly. He lived in the late 1800s. And growing up in Southern India, I would hear this name a lot as a kid. Um, but I never knew who he was. So I wanted to like recently just learn more about him. And he's got books, you know, um, Wisdom of a Sadhu, Visions of a Sadhu. Sadhu oh. is like basically a Hindu priest who kind of lives um, as a monk, basically. And um, yeah, so it's just, you know, from a pure quality of writing, it's nothing to <laughs> brag about. <laughs> but, 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 and again, a lot of the stories in those books uh, for the Western person will seem like almost ridiculous and unrealistic. Stories of healings and visions and things like that. But within the Eastern culture and context, yeah, you know, you know it, it's embraced. But but the thing about Sadhu Sundar Singh that um, I just felt so inspired by as I just read his story, and it's like uh, his his biography, his autobiography, basically, a wisdom of um, uh, of, of a Sadhu. Um, he talks about how he was supposed to be a Sadhu, like a Hindu priest, mm -hmm. and you know his parents kind of were from a Brahmin background, which is a high caste um, priestly class in India. And he's supposed to be the sadhu and, and that's what his desire was. That's what he wanted. And as a teenager, he wanted to do everything he possibly can to be a holy righteous person. Mm. But in his heart, 
he is never content. He's like, man, like no matter what I do, mm. I don't feel like I'm holy. Like, and and it's bothering him. And by any human standard, this guy is living a very righteous, like holy life by any human standard. Sure. But yet in his heart, he's like, I, I'm not holy yet. Like, why can't I be holy? He's going out and meeting with other sadhus, right? And he's one sadhu lives in a cave and he's like living away from the world. He's like, well, he's not really helping anyone. Right. He's not doing anything meaningful with his life. Yeah. He goes and meets this other sadhu who's like, like punishing his body to become holy, right? And he's like, this also seems meaningless. And one day he basically gives up on himself and on life and he lies in bed and he prays and says, whoever you are out there, God, you got to reveal yourself to me tonight because tomorrow morning I'm going to commit suicide. Mm. And so he's got this plan of like lying on this railway track and committing suicide because he said, you know, um, like he could not deal with the sin and sin that he felt in his heart. Yeah. And that night Jesus speaks to him and comes to him in, to him in a vision. Anyway, it's, 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 it's yeah. I'm fascinated. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. Uh, I, I'm going to go out and buy a copy as soon as we get I, finished I, here. I absolutely yeah. am. That is... The no. quality of the book is not great. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just, yeah. But, 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 but it's a story of a man from late yeah. 1800 who lived in India. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Robin, if people are listening to the show and they're like, I just want to know more about Eventide or what you guys are doing and kind of want to follow what's going on with you and your purpose, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, two ways, two primary ways. One is uh, reach out to info at eventidefunds.com. Okay. And um, just ask that they be signed up to our newsletter. Yeah. So they will get updates of, uh, and there'll be, we have a like regular insights posts that we email out on um, uh, just, um, you know, we, we have some people on our team that are just, you know, you want to do, if you're listening, you want to do that. That's a, it's a great, yeah, yeah. great insights. Uh, yeah. Another way to get access to that is going to the eventideinvestments.com website. We have two websites now. We're going to be merging everything into eventideinvestments.com. Um, but go to eventideinvestments.com, click on the insights link. Yep. And uh, there's really good material there. Uh, something else I would uh, encourage is for people just to connect with me on LinkedIn. Mm. On a weekly basis, I post something on LinkedIn. Yeah. And so that would be a great way to stay connected with me. Yeah, you need to do that too, because your videos and your stories and the things that uh, you're sharing are inspiring and encouraging. Um, Robin, thank you so much for making the time to be with us today. I truly appreciate it. Um, the, just the time has been rich and the stories have been just beautiful. So thank you again. Um, everyone, we will be back again with another episode of Redefining Success next week. God bless you. Have a great day.